Okay, let's commence. Welcome everyone. Today's shiur is about happiness. Happiness. How do we achieve happiness and joy? Is it possible? We, one, I think one of the hardest things in, in, in the world is to be in a perpetual state of happiness. To always be happy because we always have ups and downs. You know, you, you, you go to work, there's a disappointment there. You come home, there may be a disappointment there. And, uh, and sometimes disappointments within yourselves, things that you wanted to achieve, or you weren't able to achieve it, whatever the case may be. There's a lot of cause and reason, seemingly, to be upset, to be sad, sometimes despondent and, 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 um, and um, despair. But that's not the Torah attitude. The Torah attitude is that we should always strive for, for happiness. And it's do, according to the Torah, it's doable and achievable. Because otherwise the Torah would not demand that of us. Because we know that the Midrash says, Istakel be'oraita ubara alma. When the Almighty created the world, He created the world upon the blueprints of the Torah. Just like an architect, a builder, um, builds a building based upon the architect's blueprints and uh, the drawings and he knows exactly where to put the wall and how to put it and that how everything works and makes sense because it was an architect and an engineer who made sense of it and according to those blueprints it makes sense that this wall can hold up so and so many floors based upon the foundations etc etc the almighty created the world based upon the blueprints of the torah he looked at the Torah, so to speak, and based upon the principles of the Torah, he created the world, not the other way around. It wasn't that there is a world, and then God gave the world a, a um, road map. The Torah is a road map to navigate our way. It's the other way around. The world, in fact, is based upon the principles of Torah. Anything that exists, exists because it's stated in the Torah. Anything that the Torah demands of it is a reality and something that can be achieved, despite the fact that it may be the most hardest thing in the world to achieve perpetual happiness because of the changes of moods, because of the changes of situations and scenarios. Nonetheless, the Torah demands, us, demands it of us. David HaMelech says in Tehillim, Eivdu et Hashem besimcha. Bo lefana birinana. Serve God with joy. Come before Him in exaltation and song. So, David HaMelech is telling us that there is a possibility to serve God with joy. The sages in the Mishnah, in Ethics of Our Fathers, say clearly, Ezehu Ashir, who is enriched, who is a wealthy person, who can consider himself a wealthy person? Hasameach behalko, he who is happy with his lot, he who has found joy and happiness with whatever God gave him. In other words, he's happy with whatever he has. That is someone who is enriched, that is someone who is wealthy. So it's a different, it's a totally different outlook that the sages um, demand of us. Usually we was, would ascribe um, um, wealth. To someone who has, the more one has, the more one would be wealthy, correct? The Mishnah says no. He who is wealthy is he who has found joy with whatever it is that they have. In other words, the prerequisite for wealth is joy, is happiness. So it's something that is achievable and is not necessarily achievable with what it is that we have. Quite often it's what that we don't have. Being joyous and being content with what we have. Furthermore, there's a very interesting verse in the Bible that says that There are many curses that are stated in the Torah. And they are an outcome or an outgrowth of our behavior. It's not, e it's not hard to imagine that when a person, you know, does something silly, a person walks by a cliff, he may fall, and the consequences of that may be disastrous. 
So to the Torah warns us not to walk by a spiritual cliff, so to speak. Because you could be endangering yourself, you could fall spiritually and damage the level, the spiritual level that God demands of every single one of us and is our potential. The Torah warns us and says that if we do not serve God with joy, then there is a possibility to expose ourselves to a lot of the curses of the Torah. Which means that the source of a lot of the negative consequences of this world seemingly comes from a lack of joy, seemingly comes from not serving God with joy. And there is one more thing that the Torah adds, Mirov Kol, why? Why is it that you didn't serve God with joy? Mirov Kol, because of abundance. Because you have everything. You have an abundance. You have an abundance of wealth. We will analyze that in a minute. What's, what's the connection? Because you have everything, you didn't serve God with joy. Maybe it's because you have everything, you should, on the contrary, serve God with joy because God has given you so much. But maybe, as we will investigate shortly, maybe the answer is because you're looking for joy in the wrong places. You're looking for fulfillment and contentment in the wrong places. And thus you have really not found joy. You may be enriched, you may be wealthy, but you may you, you, you not necessarily have joy and are not able to serve God, Besimha, with, with true happiness. You haven't really found happiness. And maybe the cause of that lack of happiness is because we're striving for the wrong things. We're trying to attain and achieve the wrong things. The question is, of course, why is it that joy seems to be so important and such an in integral thing for Judaism to the extent that so many negative consequences can come about because of a lack of joy, because of a lack of happiness. How is that possible? We're not talking here about eating on Yom Kippur. We're not talking here about eating bread on Pesach. We're not talking here about desecrating Shabbat. We're not talking here about murdering anyone or, 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 or any of the, the, the great crimes of society and ills of society. We're talking about simply not having joy, not having happiness. Is that such a terrible thing? Should that then be a cause for such disaster? Well, according to the Torah, it seems to be the case. Why is that? We will soon see. If joy then, and especially and specifically joy and happiness in the service of God, is so important and so integral, one can well imagine that the Kohanim who serve God in the temple and are the representatives of the Jewish people, one can then well imagine that they are expected to serve God in the greatest of joy, in the greatest form of happiness. Wouldn't you say? Of course. We know that there is a connection. We may have the opportunity to develop this, but there is a connection between love and happiness. Where there is love, quite often there is happiness. Where there is happiness, quite often there is love. They go hand in hand. Where there is love of God, there is happiness in your service of God. Where there is happiness and joy in your service of God, there is the love of God. And we know that the Kohanim, when they bless the Jewish people, the blessing that they say, Asher kidishanu b'mitzvotav etzivanu, levarech et amo Yisrael be'ahava. We bless you, Almighty, that is commanded us concerning the mitzvah of blessing the Jewish people with love. Now, if you're blessing the Jewish people with love, the, the Kohanim are commanded to bless, to bless the Jewish people every day. And that they're commanded to bless them with love. Which means that they are to overcome any of their own feelings of animosity towards anyone. Any feelings of hatred or disappointment in anyone. And overcome all of that. And when they bless, they've got to bless with love, with no ill feelings. To be able to achieve that, you have to be able to do that with joy, and you have to be able to do that with love, with, with happiness. And the fact that, the, and the fact that David Amelech encourages us to serve God with simha, with happiness, 
how much more so then would this apply to the Kohanim that serve in the temple? Therefore, there is a very interesting question. We know that David HaMelech, the same David HaMelech, also says in Tehillim, Ve'yayin yesamah levav enosh. Wine gladdens the heart of men. You take a little bit of wine, and you know it loosens you up a little bit, and it, it, it helps you to you know, overcome you know, the difficulties and, the, and, and, and the, um, the disappointments of life. Loosens you up a little bit and lets you um, relax. relax and find, find joy. Retrace your joy. Yet we find an interesting thing. The Kohanim are prohibited from drinking wine. When they go to serve in the temple, they're prohibited from drinking wine. They're not allowed to drink, if they eat wine, they're not allowed to drink 86 mils of wine. It's not much 86 mils, about this much. That's the amount that we drink on the seder. Sorry? Less, less, they can have less, but no, no, not that amount or more. It's not much. It's just literally this much. 86 mils, you know those little cups yeah, that are yeah. That's what it is, it's nothing. It's like a little shot of wine, not, not, uh, you know, not, uh, not uh, whiskey. Wine. Why? You would think that if King David says that wine gladdens the heart of men, you would then say, you know what? The guy had a hard day. He woke up very early in the morning. The floor in the Beit HaMikdash is very cold. It's winter. And even though they had a special fire to warm them up a little bit, his wife maybe didn't prepare him breakfast, or maybe worse, burnt breakfast, or whatever the case may be. Or maybe his wife asked him to prepare her breakfast, or whatever the case may be. And he comes and he's a bit, you know, upset about something. Something's bothering him. Someone owes him money, whatever the case may be. And, you know, he's not in the greatest of state of joy, like all of us have ups and downs. Why can't he take a little shot of wine, just a little shot of wine, a cup or two, and then begin his day with a little boost and get in there and help him along his way to be joyous because he's commanded to be joyous? The answer is, is because true joy is not found from substances outside of within oneself. True joy is to be found within oneself. And this is the reason why the Torah tells us that you did not serve God with joy and happiness midov kol, because you have everything. In other words, you looked for happiness and joy from material substances, from material wealth, from things outside of yourself, external to you, external to who you are, external to your soul. And that is, that is the most damaging thing. When you don't know the source of true joy and happiness. The Kohanim, who are the representatives of the Jewish people, are to teach not only to represent us in the temple and to serve in the temple to seek our atonement and our blessing and bless us, but they're also to teach us a very important lesson. How to truly serve God and how to find happiness and joy. And happiness and joy is not found by external substances like wine or a new mobile phone or a new car or a new house or whatever the case may be. However nice they all are, but True happiness and joy is not found within them. And when we look for happiness and joy because of the wealth or because of the happiness or we, f- we move our focus from spirituality and growth within oneself and simha and joy within oneself to finding joy and happiness from other things, we will never be satisfied. Because as soon as the buzz wears off, that's it. I one time asked someone, how long does the... The, the buzz of a new car, how long does it last? So someone, told, someone said about a month. After that, you know, and now it takes, you know, you don't swap cars every, uh, every month. So, you know, people have cars for at least a couple of years and some even a decade or more. So, you know, the excitement of a new car that you buy once in who knows how long lasts you for a month. That's about it. Now what happens after that month? Now you've got to find another, and you know, cars are not cheap. You've got to find another thing that, uh, that excites you. So if, if a new car that costs forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 is one month, so a mobile phone that costs, uh, let's say, $1,000, so that's one day at best, <laughs> right? Or uh, whatever it is. A ring, two weeks. A new diamond ring, two weeks. 
when we look for joy and happiness from substances outside, we will always find disappointment because other, the buzz ultimately will wear away. And that's what the Kohanim teach us. The Kabbalists teach us a very interesting thing. The Kabbalists say that sadness, disappointment, depression is associated with impurity. The force comes from the forces of impurity, the evil inclination. Happiness and joy comes from the soul. True happiness and joy. When a person is in a state of true happiness, intrinsic happiness and joy, that comes from the soul. His soul is shining. There's a great rabbi by the name of, of uh, Rabbi Shlomo of Karlin who said that nowhere in the Bible do you find that sadness is a sin. You don't find it in the Bible. It's not one of the, six, it's not one of the 365 negative commandments. But he says no, you will not find anything more damaging than sadness and depression. Nothing is more damaging than sadness. It's not a negative commandment, but it is the most damaging thing because it removes a person from his true focus. It removes a person from being centered from within his neshama. It removes a person from true bitahon, trust and belief and faith in God. That's why we find that the natural state of a child is Happiness. Child is always happiness. It doesn't take much for a child to be happy. Always happy. And if something happens to disturb that happiness, ordinarily the child's always happy, bubbly, laughing, this, and that. If not, something's wrong. Because by, this, by the child is uncomplicated. He's not self-absorbed like an adult. Self, adults are self-absorbed. We're always thinking about ourselves. How we fit in, how we don't fit in. How this one did this, this one said that. How we have this, how we don't have that. How this one has that, and this one has that, and that one has that, and I don't have this, I'm deserving of this. And all about me was self-absorbed. The more self-absorbed you are, the more you are going to fall into sadness and depression. The more you think about yourself, the more you're going to bound to be fall into depression because that's associated with ego and ego is evil inclination and evil inclination or the, the, the forces of impurity is sadness, is dejection. Why is that? Because it's greedy, it's hungry, it's jealous, it's never satisfied. It always wants more and more and more and thus you never will become satisfied. As the Talmud says, he who has a hundred wants two hundred. He who wants two hundred wants four hundred. The Talmud says that a person never dies with half of his desires in his hand, so to speak. He never achieves half of what he... Because the nature of humanity, the nature of the evil inclination is to want more, more and more. The nature of the godly soul is to want less and less and less and be less self-absorbing and more included in God's reality. When you are included in God's reality, in God's world, in God's presence, and less self-absorbed, you don't have problems, you don't have issues. You have happiness, you have joy, you have the neshama. Like a child, like the innocence of a child. Child doesn't need much, it's just happy to live. It's just happy for the sake of happy because that is the natural state of the soul. That is the natural state of holiness. But when we grow up, we become self-absorbed and we want this and we want to keep up with that one. We don't really need as much as what we think we need. We don't really need as much as what we think we need. We don't need to eat as much as we need to eat. We don't need as much of the banks as what we think we need. What we really need is trust and faith in Hashem. How many people have had so much in their bank account and all to lose it in a moment? So what did help them? And how many people have nothing and have trust and faith in Hashem and have lived 80, 90 years and were sustained by that trust and faith and were continually happy. So we cannot use things outside of us to find happiness. Comfort, that's one thing. Leisure, another thing. But true happiness comes from within, like a child comes from within, like the neshama, it comes from within. And where does this come from? It comes from a, an, an absolute trust and faith in God. When you have trust and faith in God, you don't have sadness. Why? Because you know that everything that Hashem does is always for the good. You know that everything that occurs in this world is the will of Hashem. 
You're not self-absorbed, you're absorbed in, within. You include yourself within God's reality. And when you include yourself within God's reality, you are accepting of everything. And when you are accepting, you have a certain measure of, 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 of faith and reliance of Hashem that everything will be okay. And that everything has a purpose and a reason. And you learn to accept that and you learn to find, overcome these challenges and find joy. Because you have faith and reliance on Hashem. Like it says in the book, Hovot Al-Vavot, The Duties of a Heart, written by Rabbi Yahya Ibn Pekuda, um, one of the early Spanish scholars. And he says that a true friend that you rely on, is, uh, that you trust, what, is it, what does trust mean? It means that you totally, totally rely upon that person to do your good. Someone, you have a good relationship with someone, you totally trust that that person cares for you and, and, and wants your good and seeks your good. How much more so is this of God? God, the essence of all good, who created us, only seeks our good. Only seeks our good. And when we know and understand and recognize this, then we have a certain self, a sense of equilibrium. Peace. We, we are at peace with ourselves. We have a faith in God. But when we're depressed or when we're sad, it shows that we don't really accept what God has dished out for us. We don't really trust God that things will work out or are for our benefit or for our good. That doesn't mean to say that we can't pray for an improvement the way we understand things because God sees and understands things that we don't see in the puzzle. We only look at a couple of pieces of the puzzle where God knows all of the puzzle. We can still pray to God to change this. But someone who's in a state of joy is someone who who accepts that which God does. And everything's for a reason. Like I told someone who was going through a difficult time and was having difficulty accepting this, how do you know that this is not a test from God to bring something greater, that this will be a catalyst for something greater? That perhaps in your current state you are not so deserving, but you will be deserving through going through this. Well, how do you know that this is not to propel you to higher spiritual heights that will allow you to achieve greater things and wondrous things? And yet we're mourning going through this difficulty and we're sad going through this difficulty of which, in essence, this difficulty is really a catalyst for much greater and wondrous things. If it was revealed to us, we wouldn't have free choice. And then it wouldn't be an issue. But it's not revealed to us. But if we knew that everything in this world and every challenge and every difficulty that we go through is a catalyst, is a stepping stone for higher things, for greater things, we would embrace it with love. We would embrace it with with happiness. We would have a sense of equilibrium and peace within ourselves. But when we don't, it shows that there's a lack of faith and a lack of trust. And we're not at peace. And we are rejecting and we're not accepting of what God brings upon us. Another very important principle, and this is something that I taught myself, I can't say to the greatest of degrees, but to a certain degree. When you go through a difficulty and you accept that difficulty or that situation, you are serving God. When you have an opportunity, for example, to give charity... So here someone asks you charity and you give charity. That's your free choice. And not always do we do do that mitzvah selflessly. Sometimes it could be for ulterior motives. Sometimes you give the charity because you want to give the charity. God, I'm giving charity. You know, I'm scratching your back. You scratch my back. I'm giving charity, so you help me. I've got this difficulty. You help me with that. Or good health for my children. Or because of this. Or because of that. And that's fine. It's still considered charity. And it's still a worthy deed. And it's still a good thing. Or you're doing it because you want people to praise you, or you want that person to praise you, or you're embarrassed, or whatever the case may be. It's not always 100% for the sake of heaven. It could be somewhat tainted. It's still good. It's still great. Wonderful. But it's not pure service of God. Where do you know that something is purely for the sake of God, pure service of God? When God brings something upon you and you accept it, and you live through it, and you're able to find acceptance and happiness and joy... There you have true service of God. You're serving God. If God brings a limp upon you and you're walking to the synagogue with a limp, you're serving God with that limp. Because God wished it upon you. 
God brought this upon you for whatever reason. Whether it is to cleanse us, whether it is to, as a stepping stone for higher spiritual attainments, whether it is for a, a physical blessing that currently in our current state we are undeserving, but we needed this particular test to go through to test our faith and be worthy of it, whatever the reason is, whatever the case may be. But when you go through that particular thing and you accept it, that is true service of God. There you know that you're truly serving God. And that comes from the soul. That power of faith, of belief, comes from the soul. And that's what we all have to strive for, to access, because that's where you'll find happiness. You will not find happiness with the external things. And that's what the Kohanim teach us, that they cannot drink wine because they have to find happiness within themselves. And that is why the Torah says, you, all of these punishments came about because you, you did not serve God with joy. It doesn't say you didn't serve God. You can serve God. But if you don't serve God with joy, it is a very negative thing because your focus has shifted from serving God, from, from, from entering God's reality to being self-absorbed and worrying about yourself and thinking about the physical and material world. You've shifted the focus. The Holy Arizal writes that the greatest um, sense of joy that he ever felt was when he fulfilled the mitzvah. He never felt any greater joy. Don't worry about the fly, he wants to listen as well. He <laughs> wants a bit of joy as well, when you're bothering him and making him all sad and upset. <laughs> the greatest joy that he ever felt never came from anything other than a mitzvah. Why? Because a mitzvah, you move yourself from yourself, from being self-absorbed, and you're serving God. And you're entering God's reality. And when you enter God's reality, God's world, there's no greater sense of joy. You're losing yourself, you're losing your problems and your issues, and there you will find the greatest source of joy. Not for naught, the word simha in Hebrew spells the same letters as hamashiach. The Redeemer. The Redeemer. Every single one of us, every single one of us has a spark of the Redeemer or a redemption within ourselves. So the Redeemer or the redemption that we need and we ask for and we deserve is found within ourselves. How? Through joy. And how do you achieve joy? By acceptance of the will of God. And that's why the sages say, Ezehu Ashir, Asameach Behalko. Who is truly enriched, who is truly wealthy, he who finds joy with whatever God gave him. Sameach Behalko, with his portion, whatever that portion may be. Whatever that portion, whatever God has brought upon him or her, he's happy with that. When you're happy with that, that's where you found true wealth. Not through external acquisitions. Because through external acquisitions, you do not find joy. You may find a comfortable bed, a bit more comfortable than a cheaper bed, but not joy. I marvel, whenever I go to Israel, I marvel at the simplicity of how people live. I mean, we ourselves, when I, when I, was, I was born in Jerusalem, we grew up in a one bedroom or one and a half bedroom unit. That's it. That's all there was. Six kids. Two parents, that's all there was in a one and a half unit bedroom, that's it. And people are happy. People are, and let me tell you something, when my grandparents came to visit us, we were even greater and more happier. Today, God forbid that someone comes and shares the room of a child. Oh my God, forget about the bed. Just the room, the, the bed next door, next door that we bought for the visitors. And when my grandparents came, it was the greatest joy. Why? Because we slept under the table, the dining room table. Ah, oh, that was unbelievable happiness. We were so excited. Grandparents are coming. We slept under the dining room table. Four kids, three kids, whatever it was, I can't remember. And we were so happy. It wasn't the extra bed. It wasn't the extra fluffy cover, pillow that made us happy. It was more people that came to us, more family that came, more. That's what caused us more happiness. That's what gave, gave us more joy. It's interesting to note that, you know, we're saying that this is a reality. It's difficult. It's difficult. 
There are times, and we all go through difficult times, that we have to, we have to force happiness upon ourselves. Mm-hmm. Either, by, either by looking at all the blessings that God has given us, or by learning how to transcend ourselves. And I say this often. If there be one word that would categorize Judaism, it's transcendence. Transcendence. To transcend self. To be happy all times is to transcend yourself. What is Mashiach? What is Mashiach? Mashiach removes us from the exile mentality into the concept of redemption. What is a redemption? A revelation of God. Exile is a concealment of God. So when we live in an in a exile mentality, we are concealing God or we, we, we accept that as a reality. Redemption is a revelation of God, that we live with a revelation of God, that God is real to us. It's not abstract, it's real. If it's real, then there has to be happiness in your life. And you have to be able to, to impress this upon ourselves, to be able to find joy and happiness despite all of the difficulties that we may be going for. And that takes a lot of thought, and that takes a lot of training, but it can be done. And... And, and Maimonides says a very surprising thing in the laws of kings. And he says, based upon a verse in the Torah, that the Kohen would address the people before they needed to go to a war against their enemies, to defend themselves, to defend their families, to defend their children. Anybody who's fearful, go home. They would order anybody who is fear, go home. Maimonides says that we are not permitted to fear when we go to war. That's the most natural feeling, fear. Who would not fear when they go to war? How can you demand that of a person? Because if you truly have trust in God, there's no room for fear. There's room only for joy. There's no room for fear. So the Torah demands this of us, even in the most difficult moments, to face your enemy in battle. That is the most frightening thing in the world. You're talking about perhaps not coming back from war, losing your life. Worse, not being able to support your family, not being able to be there for your family. For any parent, that is worse than losing one's life. Losing one's life is easy. So we reunite with God. It's a blissful existence in heaven. But not to be there for one's children, not to be there for one's spouse, not to support one's family, not to hold their hand, not to help them through life. That's the difficulty. That's the frightening thing. It's a frightening thought. Yet we are expected to overcome that thought and go into battle without fear. That is, that is an unbelievable thing. But if Maimonides brings it in Halakha, and if the Kohen would address the people before war and say, anybody is fearful, go home. What do you mean? You're now risking manpower. Who would risk manpower? When, you, when you're at war, you don't want to risk manpower. Because anybody who's fearful doesn't trust in God, doesn't belong in the army of Hashem, and is in danger of frightening other people. Who, whose heart is strong and who have faith in God and who are in a state of joy. You don't belong here. Go, go home. Don't bring me down. The Kohen doesn't want you to bring other people. Go home. We prefer to have a smaller army that is fully trusting in God than a big army that doesn't trust in God. Go home. We don't need people depressed. That's how... So on the one hand, we see that we're willing to risk numbers and more bigger army to anybody who's, who's frightened. You, you don't belong with us. Yet, even in times of war, we're able to reach a level of true trust and true joy in God. That's a very difficult thing, but the Torah demands it of us. And if the Torah demands it of us, and it is the blueprint by which we were created, then it's in our DNA. Then we can achieve it. It's there. We just have to find the right, uh, the right uh, plug, the right button to press, the right meditation, the right thoughts, the right ideas tend to, tend to continually reinforce us. There's a very interesting thought that the Baal Tanya writes that we have one of the thoughts that can help us achieve a state of, of joy. And he, and he gives a metaphor of a pauper who lives in the slums and the gutters. And this pauper, the king passed by and lifted him from the gutters and dressed him beautifully and showed him love and appreciation. Can you imagine the state of joy and the (laughs) 
one can imagine the state of joy that one would feel by the king himself coming and uplifting us. This the Almighty did to every single one of us. Every single one of us is a, is a body. What's a body? Body comes from the earth, nothing. It turns to worms and maggots. We all know our own inhibitions, we all know our own limitations, we all know our own evil thoughts and weaknesses and desires. We all know how far away we are truly from spirituality and God. Yet God came and took us out of Egypt. And yet God came and gave us the Torah and embraced us and hugged us and lifted us with all of these mitzvot and uplifted us and showed us love and care and concern. How can we not be happy? How can we not rejoice, says the Baal Atanya. This is something that we have to think about a lot. There's a very interesting story a metaphor that the Baal Shem Tov teaches us. The Baal Shem Tov says, to what is this compared? To what is this world compared to? To a beautiful melody. And a melody has many different components to it. Low, low tones, high tones, rough sounding, soft, drum, bang. One time... <clears throat> One time there was a, um, a, a, a band of musicians that were in a street corner playing a very beautiful and uplifting melody. And anybody who came by those people who were playing the melody, the, this band, were enchanted by it and began to dance. Anybody who came by was uplifted and began to dance and was moved to the beat and their whole mood changed. If you came sad, you were happy. If you came happy, you were even more happier. If someone upset you, you forgot about it. All you thought about was the music and the melody and how beautiful it was, how inspiring it was and how it uplifted you and you danced to the music. Came a deaf man and he's looking around and he sees people dancing and jumping up and down and he thinks, boy, these people are crazy. What are they doing? What are they jumping up and down for? What are they, uh, what are they dancing for? If he only understood, if he could only hear the beautiful melody that was played, he too would dance. He too would forget his situation. He too would forget that he has difficulties in life. But alas, he's deaf, so he can't hear it, says the Baal Shem Tov. That the Almighty, the whole world, the way it's constructed, the way it's created, plays wonderful, beautiful melodies. Each one of us plays a part in that melody. And we all together make this world wondrous and beautiful with the good points and with the bad points with the good times and with the difficult moments. It's all a melody that sings God praise. Because as I mentioned before, every moment in our lives is a, has a purpose and is exactly tailor-made for us and we have to go through it. And by going through it, it's a praise to God, is, is, is a is service of God. And it's a song to God. But the deaf man cannot hear it and cannot dance to this melody, cannot be happy, cannot be uplifted, because he is deaf. Let us not be spiritually deaf, that we cannot see that in everything in this world, in the rustle of the trees, and in every moment of our lives, is a melody that we can all dance and sing to. And I just want to conclude with two interesting stories, as our custom for our monthly shiur. One is a very interesting story that taught me a lot. <clears throat> a person came to the great master, Rabbi Dov Ber of Mizrich. And came to him with an interesting question. The Talmud in Mesechet Brachot says, Keshem shemevarech al hatova, kach mevarech al hara'a. Just as we recite a blessing when good things happen, if something good happens to you, you can either make a bracha shehiyanu, thank you God for sustaining me to this day to experience this beautiful thing, or hatove hametiv, he who does good and, does, and, and is good for others. There are different blessings that we make for good news. So the Talmud says, just as we bless God, for the good, so too must we bless God or make a blessing for when bad things, God ha forbid, happens. So God forbid, when we lose a loved one, what's the blessing? We make a blessing to God. We say, blessed you, O God, 
Dayan Hayemet, who is the true judge. We accept and acknowledge that you judge the world with truth, with integrity, and everything that you do is absolutely truth. What does truth mean? Truth means absolute. Some scholars teach us that we have to read the Talmud properly. It doesn't just mean just as we make a blessing for good and acknowledge that good comes from, from God, and that we, when God forbid bad happens, we acknowledge that it comes from God. In other words, everything that happens in this world comes from God and we acknowledge it. No. We've got to read it like this. Keshem shemevarecha la tova. Just as you bless over the good, how do you bless over the good? When you, if you, someone told you you won the lottery, 20 million dollar lottery, how, how joyous would you be? I don't know whether you'd be able to be so composed there, Elaine. I won't be. I would be saying this blessing standing up. I would not be sitting down. See this bottle of wine? <laughs> I won't need it. <laughs> I will not be composed. Absolutely. But that, 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 that will definitely make me externally happy. <laughs> The point is, when something good happens, you also have to bless God and acknowledge God. True happiness comes from within. But when something good happens, when a child is born, you make a blessing. You, make it, you, you thank God. And how do you bless God when a child is born, when you, bless, when you make the blessing? Or when you buy something very special, or good tidings came your way. You heard wonderful news that the relative who was lost in battle, or, or the soldier in Israel was captured, was released and alive and well. How happy are we? Wonderfully elated and, and, uh, and overjoyed. The same feelings that we bless God, we have to bless God when God forbid something bad happens. In other words, it's not just, we don't read it as, just as you acknowledge God in time, good times, acknowledge bad, God in bad times, no. With the, just as you acknowledge God. In other words, when you acknowledge God when things are happening, how do you acknowledge Him? In an elated, joyous way. Just as you acknowledge God that way. So too must you acknowledge God with the same sense of joy and happiness when things not so great happen the way we understand it down below, the way God understands it. Everything that God does has, is, is, is good and for our benefit. But our eyes are unable to appreciate it. And that's fair enough. So someone came to the Magid and asked him, how can you achieve this? How can you possibly bless God with the same feelings of exaltation and joy and happiness for bad when good for 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 for, for bad for, for bad with the same feelings where the good things happen? How can you do that? He says, "I'll send you to my disciple." His disciple's name was Reb Zusha of Anipoli. Interesting to note that both the master, the teacher. And the disciple are both buried in the same city of Anipoli, which I visited 25 years ago. They're both buried next to each other, and I merited to visit both their graves and pray there. And so this student goes to the disciple and travels to the city and knocks on the door, Oh, Rabbi Zusha. And Rabbi Zusha opens the door, and he welcomes him, and please come in. But the man is awestruck by the poverty of Reb Zusha. Reb Zusha is not, doesn't have a table. He has an old door. And the old door sitting on one of those, you know, in Israel we used to have these big tins. You don't see it over here. You know, Israel is a more a rougher place. You know, when you grow up in Israel, you see one wonderful thing. You see these old tins of tar. <laughs> we used to roll them and play with them. We used to put things in them. And yeah, it was a tin and the table's on the tin. And for a chair, he doesn't have a nice, comfortable chair. He has a, an old crate. And that's what he was sitting on. And in those days, when you were poor, you didn't have flooring. You had mud. And the mud, you know, the table, and if it's a bit wet, you know, it sinks and it moves. And you know what I mean? And it's wet and it's damp and there's a smell there and it's muddy and it's, and it's uh, not healthy. Not good for asthma. I'm not sure whether Zusha had asthma or not, but I can well imagine that it wasn't the best, the best uh, scenario. And he comes in and he says, God, such poverty, such... Anyway, he welcomes him, gives him his seat, gives him a nice uh, wooden uh, cup to drink in. And he says, how can I help you? And he says, I tell you, the master sent me to learn from you how you can bless over the bad with the same feelings of joy from the good. And Abzusha looks at him and he says, in wonderment, he says, he sent you to me? Why would he send you to me? 
never in my life ever had one moment of bad. He was not only poor, he was the poor of the poorest. Yet he, he, he never saw his life, because everything comes from God, he never saw that as bad. It was always good, everything that God gave. That is true joy. That is joy that comes from the neshama. That is not one that comes from the body that, that always wants and is never satisfied and wants more and more and more. Now, of course, it's very hard for us to be able to achieve this level. But at least we've got to know about it and at least a little bit try to duplicate it and at least be thankful for God for the good and the wealth and the, and the, and the comfort that God has given us. I want to tell you one more story. And with that, we'll conclude. A very interesting story. I love this story. It's in, found in Medrash in Shira Shirim. <clears throat> the Medrash says a very interesting story that took place about 2,000 years ago. In the time of Rabbi Shimbar Yochai, the great Kabbalist, the author of the Zohar, the most famous Kabbalistic work. Rabbi Shimbar Yochai, as you know, is buried in Miron. And in two weeks' time, we will be celebrating Lagba Omer, which is the anniversary of his passing in the synagogue with a great dinner and festivities. Wednesday Please come night. to that. Wednesday, Wednesday night and two Wednesdays from now, 25th of May. So listen to the story. Aside from being a great Kabbalist, Rabbi Shimbar Yochai was one of the great leaders and great rabbis of the Jewish people and adjudicator. A couple came to him. They were married for over 10 years and they did not have children. And the halakha allows that if people are married for 10 years and do not have children, are permitted to divorce. Maybe their mazal will change, maybe this one will marry this one and this one will marry that one and each one will have children. So they came to Rabbi Shimbar Yochai and they said, Rabbi, we've dis- discussed it amongst ourselves and, uh, and you know, I've, 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 I've come and I've decided that you know, I, I would like, I'd like to ask a divorce from my wife. And she agreed. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai not only looked into their words, but looked deeply into their eyes and in their hearts. And he says, I agree. On one condition. What's that? He says, when you married your wife, you married her with great joy and happiness and fanfare. When you divorce your wife, make a big party celebration and fanfare, and then I agree to divorce you. The next day you come to the Bedin, and I will divorce you. So he says, okay. So he makes a wonderful party, and he invites everybody. You know, one can imagine an invitation. Please come to our divorce. <laughs> Great party. Come formal attire, uh, cocktails at 6.30, you know, pictures at 6.20, at uh, 6.45, and, uh, and, uh, and, and dinner at 7 o'clock. There'll be music, there'll be dancing, and there'll also be wine. <laughs> So he makes a big party and he's very happy and he's very this. And in, in the midst of the party, he becomes very elated and very joyous. And he looks at his wife and he says, you know what? You have been so good to me. Anything you like, anything you want in this home, it's yours. You can take it and keep it. Okay? Fine. The next day, after drinking some wine, he wakes up and he finds himself in the home of his wife, the home of his in-laws and the home of his wife. And he wakes up and he says, what am I doing here? And he says, what do you mean? You said that anything that I wanted, what is most precious to you in this home, you can take. You are the most precious thing to me and I've chosen you. When he, when he heard this, he burst out in tears and he was so moved and so touched by the love of his wife that he went, took her to the Beddin of Rabbi Shimbar Yochai and he said, I no longer want to divorce my wife. I have a new love and affection for her that despite the fact that we do not have children, I cannot divorce her. Rabbi Shimbar Yochai smiled because that was his intention to appreciate what we have. And he blessed them, and indeed the next year they were blessed with a child. Mm. The sages tell us, Simha pores geder. Joy is able to break unbelievable boundaries. What we can achieve with joy is so unbelievable and is so great 
and it's so wondrous it opens up the heavens. It is not worthwhile for us to be in a state of sadness, to be in a state of depression ever, ever, ever. Because so much can be achieved in a state of joy, so much blessing. But the way to reach that blessing is with a newfound faith in God. May the Almighty help that we'll always have faith in Hashem and be accepting of, his, of, of whatever He brings, but it should only be good and it should only be blessings. And may we only know happiness and blessings. Amen. Amen.